Well, good morning, Royal Lane. It is wonderful to be with you here again in person after these difficult years that we have all endured. Um, it is, there is nothing like being in corporate worship like this. And because of the pandemic, what a wonderful innovation that we have people from all over the country who are able to join us in worship this morning as well. I do feel a special kinship with this church, um, not only because I grew up in the pew behind uh, Sarah and Rodney, uh, but also because this church has nurtured me personally in many ways. You know, when I moved to Dallas as um, uh, just out of law school attorney, I was in City Church uh, with Jamie, Clark Souls, and Thad, and so many of you uh, others who are here. And so that church nourished my spirit at a really important time of my life, and so I am grateful for that. And I am grateful for the partner ministry that Royal Lane continues to have with us at BJC, for your prayers, for your support, for your activism for religious freedom for all. And I was very grateful to get to spend time with so many of you yesterday um, to talk more in depth about our work. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Well, as you can tell from the sermon title, title, I am going to go there today. <laughs> I am going to wade into our fraught, contentious, and I believe dangerous political moment. You know, you invite a guest preacher from Washington, D.C., who spends her life at the intersection of religion and politics. I didn't know what you would expect. But we are in an election year, of course. We have national midterms. We have statewide elections here in Texas. But this year is different than politics as usual. Last Sunday, the New York Times had a front page story entitled, Democracy Challenged, Twin Threats to Governing Ideals Put America in Uncharted Territory. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist David Leonhardt uh, wrote this story, and he acknowledged first that we've had other times of deep political turmoil. The Great Depression in the 1930s, World War II in 1940s, the threat of the Cold War in the 50s, the Civil Rights Movement of the 60s that was followed by assassinations and riots, the Vietnam War, the impeachment of a president. We've had these tough moments as Americans before. But Leonhardt writes, yet during each of these previous times of tumult, the basic dynamics of American democracy held firm. Candidates who won the most votes were able to take power and attempt to address the country's problems. The current period, he writes, is different. The twin threats he writes about in this piece, which I really do recommend to you if you haven't read it yet, are one, a refusal to, def to accept defeat in an election, and two, that power to set policy is increasingly disconnected from public opinion. Our democracy, such as we ever had one, is on the brink of collapse. And instead of uniting to meet this challenge, Americans are increasingly divided into two warring camps. Leonhardt points to different causes for the divide, including frustration over slow-growing living standards. He also writes that these divisions reflect cultural fears, especially among white people, that the United States is being transformed into a new country, more racially diverse and less religious, they believe, with rapidly changing attitudes toward gender, language, and more. These economic frustrations and cultural fears have combined to create a chasm in American political life. He goes on to explain the political contest between the two can feel existential to people in both camps, with disagreements over nearly every prominent issue. He then quotes Liliana Mason, a 
political scientist and author of Uncivil Agreement, How Politics Became Our Identity, she writes, when we're voting, we're not just voting for a set of politics, but for what we think makes us Americans and who we are as a people. So the question I'd like to wrestle with you here this morning is, what are we to do about it? What are our obligations, both as Americans and Christians, not the same thing, in this election season in which democracy itself is being challenged? Well, we're Baptists, and so I think a good place to ground our discernment is always in the scripture. And so our gospel lesson finds Jesus at odds with the powers that be, as he often was. And here he's at odds with both the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Pharisees, you remember, were the religious purists, Jewish patriots who despised Roman rule. And the Herodians were supporting the descendants of Herod, and they were working with the Romans. So these two opposing camps were joining forces to trap Jesus, who was starting to threaten them both. And the topic we know was paying taxes. Turns out it was as unpopular then as it is now. And after some really false, disingenuous flattery, they ask him this question, and they are sure they're going to get him, right? Just as Barrett told, you, told us. It's a gotcha question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? If he says yes, he's going to ruin his credibility with the Jewish people. And if he says no, the Romans are going to try him for treason. So they really think they got him. But Jesus, aware of their malice, according to the gospel, had the perfect answer. And he made them give it to him, if you notice. He didn't answer the question. He asked for someone to bring him a coin, and he said, whose head is this? The emperor. And then he said, well, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, Give to God the things that are God's. And they went away amazed. But Jesus' response is really more than an answer to the question of just a tax obligation. It gets to the heart of this tension that we find ourselves in here today. We have both political obligations and spiritual ones. We do owe allegiance to our country. We also owe a higher allegiance to God. And notice first that these things are not the same thing. Jesus is teaching us that our renderings are distinct, different, and to be separated. And as Baptists, we have found theological underpinnings to the importance of the separation of church and state from this very passage. If we confuse our political institutions with our religious institutions, if we merge them in our rhetoric and in our practice, if we cause one to try to control the other, then we start to replace our religion of Christianity with a political ideology of Christian nationalism. We are also going to get our offerings all mixed up and we are going to fail to follow this central teaching of Jesus. Now, Jesus says that we are to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In saying this, Jesus affirms that we do have political obligations. Of course, in Jesus' time and place, as part of an oppressed community under the occupying Romans' rule and empire, those obligations were forced upon them. They were not freely chosen. So how do we interpret this scripture for our modern times? What are our obligations to the government? Well, guess what? We're not going to find a literal answer to that question in our Bible. That's because our religious teachings do not control our political duties. These are separate things. Also, of course, Jesus did not live in the 21st century United States. 
But the U.S. government actually gives some really good guidance on the duties of citizenship, and they give it to people who are trying to become citizens. But those of us who have been citizens for a while kind of need a refresher on what are these duties of citizenship. So you can go, as I did, to USCIV. Dot, oh, sorry, USCIS.gov, and you can see the obligations of American citizenship. We are to support and defend the Constitution, stay informed of the issues affecting our community, participate in the democratic process. That means vote and help others to vote. We are to respect and obey federal, state, and local laws. We are to respect the rights, beliefs, and opinions of others. We are to participate in our local community. We are, it's still here, pay income and other taxes honestly and on time to federal, state, and local authorities. So taxes really do endure and stand the test of time from the biblical times. We're to serve on a jury when called upon and we're to defend the country if the need should arise. It's, it's really a pretty good list, and I think a helpful civics lesson for us all. Our political engagement is not optional, and certainly not now, when our democracy is on life support. We have neither the luxury nor the permission to disengage right now. And being active in our politics is consistent with the teachings of Jesus. Now remember, politics can both be partisan and nonpartisan. Voting and helping others to vote is a requirement of citizenship. And it is a tragedy that this cornerstone of American citizenship has been turned into a partisan wedge issue. But as we fulfill these duties as patriotic Americans, we should not confuse our obligations to the government with our obligations to God. They are different and distinct. So what are our renderings to God? Well, for this question, unlike the question of what we owe to Caesar, we can and should turn to Holy Scripture. But in this passage from Matthew, Jesus doesn't tell us what to render to God. He says the coin goes to Caesar, but what is for God? And I'm wondering if in this moment, Jesus, himself a Jew familiar with the Hebrew Bible, didn't have that teaching from Micah in his head at that moment that we heard so beautifully expressed by the choir and the musicians. Micah asked about what to render to God. And the answer was, O oh mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but three things? Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. It's simple. It's elegant. Yet so encompassing and challenging and profound. What stands out to me in, in revisiting these beautiful words of Scripture in this current context is how inextricably linked our renderings to God are to our obligations to each other. We honor God by doing justice and loving kindness, and we can do neither without considering and tending to the needs of others. Or as Jesus taught, we love God by loving our neighbors. And our neighbors, Jesus also taught, includes everyone, even those and especially those who are different from us. We are to love our neighbors who look different from us, who worship differently from us, who live in other neighborhoods than we do, who speak languages other than we do, and yes, who vote differently than we do. This gospel message of love can be directly at odds with so much of what we are hearing in the lead up to this November's election, including, sadly, from religious leaders. 
Case in point, Dr. Al Mohler, president of Southern Baptist Seminary, spoke at the First Baptist Church in Atlanta earlier this month at the Family Research Council's Pray, Vote, Stand Summit 2022. And he declared in his 20-minute speech first that we are at a time of war. And if the people don't like it, they can take it up with God and the Old Testament. And then he goes on to say that at this time of war, Christians are required to, quote, vote rightly. He said that pastors should make clear to their congregants that if they do not vote or they vote wrongly, they are unfaithful. Because the vote, he said, is a powerful stewardship. Well, this theology, I will admit, is so confusing for me that it is difficult to even know where to begin. But it sounds to me like Dr. Moeller has his renderings really mixed up. He thinks that voting is a rendering to God, and it seems like he, Moeller, has created a faithfulness test that lines up pretty remarkably well with straight-ticket Republican voting. Not only that, but what kind of pastoral advice is this? to divide congregations and what is already a denomination in rapid decline by using a voting guide to determine faithfulness. It's also, I would argue, unbiblical. You know, Paul dealt with some warring factions at his time as well. Like 21st century United States, the churches in 1st century Galatia were also struggling mightily with tribalism. Paul is so angry with the Galatians that in his letter to them, he either forgets or forgoes his customary words of thanksgiving for them. He gets right to it. A rival version of the faith has come into their midst in Galatia, a different gospel, and they are dividing themselves into teams. Their teams were divided over whether or not they'd been circumcised or not. And Paul is trying to argue to them that their distinctions, their differences, are meaningless. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. Can we also add there is no longer Democrat or Republican? For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul is not denying that there are differences between them. He just says that we are all equally children of God. Our Christian witness, I would like to suggest to us today, to our divisive politics, can bring this idea of equality before God to our public square. We engage We help others to vote. We educate ourselves about the issues and the candidates on the ballot. We push back against lies and misinformation. We insist on truth and integrity in the process, but we stop short of vilifying and dehumanizing our political opponents. And we continue to see them as Jesus sees them and as Jesus sees us, imperfect, and redeemed children of God. We refuse to judge their faithfulness based on a voting guide. If God doesn't do that, then why should we? And so if that's our role as individual Christians, what's our role as the church? What can, how can the church provide a witness of the gospel of love in this critical moment? Well, again, sadly, we have some prominent examples of what not to do. This summer, Representative Lauren Boebert of Colorado made headlines when during a speech at a church, she said, the church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. Well, she got it half right, but that's still a failing grade and something that's really concerning for a member of Congress to be making this statement. According to our constitutional protections for religious freedom, of course, the government doesn't direct the church, and the church doesn't direct the government. 
We also have examples of churches that would rather operate like political packs than houses of worship. In Pennsylvania earlier this month, Grace Life Church hosted gubernatorial candidate Doug Mastriano for something advertised as an educational forum, but what looked like in practice much more like a political rally. Pastor Bruce Schaefer told his congregation to, quote, get ready for a great blood of Jesus red wave this November. And then he introduced Mastriano as a wonderful man of God as a governor. And then he organized, or encouraged the pastors to organize up to 1,000 churches to vote for Mastriano in the election. Well, unlike Representative Boebert and unlike Pastor Schaefer, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. got it right in a 1958 sermon called A Knock at Midnight. And his prophetic words speak perfectly to our moment, so I'm going to read a passage from that sermon here to you today. The church must be reminded once again that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state, never its tool. As long as the church is a tool of the state, it will be unable to provide even a modicum of bread for men at midnight. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal and cease to be an echo of the status quo, it will be relegated to an irrelevant social club with no moral or spiritual authority. If the church does not participate actively in the struggle for peace, economic and racial justice, it will forfeit the loyalty of millions and cause people everywhere to know that it is an institution whose will has atrophied. But if the church will free itself from the shackles of a deadening status quo and recovering its great historic mission will proceed to speak and act fearlessly and insistently on the questions of justice and peace, it will enkindle the imagination of humankind. It will fire the souls of people and imbue them with a glowing and ardent love for truth, justice, and peace. People far and near will then see the church as that great fellowship of love, which provides light and bread for lonely travelers at midnight. Well, we have a lot of lonely travelers at midnight right now who are looking for love for truth, for justice, for peace. May we be bold and brave enough in this critical and divided moment to be that Christian witness for our politics. Not to confuse our renderings, but to understand our responsibilities as patriotic Americans, to understand what the Lord requires of us as children of God, to recognize the difference between the two, and to build up the church to be neither the master nor the servant of the state, but always its conscience. Amen.